Turn to Bible and read this John. Today I want to speak to you about the sailing of the waters. Hallelujah. Everybody say, sailing of the waters. John chapter 5. John chapter 5, Gospel of John chapter 5, from verse 1. If you say amen. amen. Bible says, After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem, by the sheep gate, a pool in Arami called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades or pathways, in these lay a multitude of invalids, sick, blind, lame, and paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain season into the pool and stared the water. Whoever stepped in first after the staring of the water was healed of whatever disease he had. What man Today, God, for this opportunity, we exalt your name. God, I pray that you will stir the waters in this place today. God, that you will separate us with your presence and anointing. Cover us with your glory, I pray. Speak to us. Come take control, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Now the story starts with a feast in Jerusalem. Bible says there was a feast happening in Jerusalem. And this was one of the annual feasts. And when Jesus heard about it, he also came to Jerusalem. And likewise, many people from all over Israel, they came to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast. Like Phoenix fun fair happening. Everybody getting dressed. Everybody with the choirs and instruments and all the singers and all the professionals they're getting towards Jerusalem and they're singing and praising God. All of them heading towards Jerusalem. They have these rituals. They have the
cannot see his glory anymore. We cannot see his presence anymore. We cannot see miracles happening. We cannot see directions in our lives because we are gone blind. All things held him, but no sight. No sight. No sight, no sense where we're heading to. The second kind of the church is the lame. The Bible says they were also lying there, the lame. Lame are those they can't see. But they do not have the strength on their legs to walk on those paths. And they're those kinds who know that he's not supposed to go into that place. He's not supposed to walk into morality and sin, but they still keep doing that. They know that the path that God has called them to do is righteousness and purity. And they know this is the path to walk, but they are spiritually lame. Why? Because in their legs, there's no strength to walk in the righteousness. There's no strength for them to say no to the path or the place where they are in. They are gone spiritually lame. why they keep coming back to church. That's why they will force the children to come to church. Praying and waiting that one day, one moment, that the waters from the presence of God will be shared and the children will be healed. That one day will make a difference in their lives. Now, as I, well, the Lord really took me into this whole scene, in, in the vision, as I, I was meditating on this word for almost two weeks now. I, now I realize that the journey to Bethesda wasn't an easy journey. Can you imagine that you paralyzed? And now you heard that there's a healing happening in that pool. And you might be 200 k's or 300 k's away from it. Who is going to take you? Some of us, we grew up in Christian family. When we accepted the Lord, there was a lot of festivity happening. You know, Daddy called all his friends and church members. My daughter, my son got baptized. And there was a bride. And there was a Thanksgiving service. But there are those who had a journey not that easy when they accepted the Lord. 
When they accepted the Lord, they, they were rejected. They were despised. They were disowned by their own families because journey to the house of God, journey to this place called outpouring, the place of outpouring, the house of grace and mercy, journey to the church is not easy. And can you imagine you all paralyzed and you're dying on your bed and you call your son and you say, son, please can you take me to Jerusalem? I heard there's a miracle happening in Jerusalem. I heard there's a change happening in the church. There's miracles that are happening in the church. I heard there's revival in the church. Please can you take me? And after going through all these challenges, the Bible says, he was there. But you know, for me, it's even shocking to think that he waited for 38 years. Half of his life, he waited by that pool. 38 years, he waited and waited and waited. 38 years of his life, every time when somebody got healed, he heard the screams, praise God, I got my healing, but he is still there. Everybody, at any time when a lame got his healing and started shouting and jumping and walking, saying, praise God, I got my healing and he is still there. waited and waited and waited he had come through a long way this journey of waiting for this miracle was not easy for him he had left his family he left his town he left his friends everything he had everything he desired everything he worked for now seeking for one moment one encounter with this living God who is able to heal him You know the amazing thing is, and he comes to the to the pool now, and he reaches Bethesda. He realizes that if he dips himself in the water, he's not going to get healed. So he had, and then they told him, "No, it's not happening all the time. You come here, it's not happening all the time." It's only a set time, certain time, Bible says. It's only that certain season. The angel of God comes and then the healing takes place. And I believe this is the biggest misconception in the church at large. We find church a quick, quick fix. You come to church and everything will come right. And we build our faith on that kind of situation and faith. And what happened along the way when nothing is happening, you find many who believe in such things, they turn back to the worldly things. They turn back to the unbelief. Some of them, they even change their religion. And they say that, you know, it didn't do any good to me. Why? The faith was built They said that they can take a walk to the church, to this place called according a house of grace and mercy, and they will be healed. They did not know, they were not taught that there is a price to pay, and you have to carry your cross every day. And you depend on the grace and mercy of God every day of your life. And the faith that is built on such things, the quick fix, it's always, they lose their battle in finding God, they lose their battle in miracles, they just give up easily, because the foundation is not strong. When he reached at the pool, he had to change his mindset, that coming to this house is not going to heal him immediately, coming to the church is not going to make everything right for you. You're 
continuous fellowship, your continuous seeking of God will make a difference. He's there now. And now he's, he had to wait because when he's told that there's only one moment for that whole day, while the steering is happening in the water, whoever jumps in gets healed. Hallelujah. And then after a few seconds or maybe a minute, the steering stops. And if you made your way in that particular moment to the pool, you will be healed. The Bible says, whoever and whatever disease they had. One moment with God is worth more than a thousand years of labor. One moment of favor, one moment of grace and mercy from above will change everything about us. And he had to wait. He had to be there. Now the Bible says he was taught whoever jumps in first while the strain is happening. Whatever disease he had, he will be healed. You know, there are always opportune, opportune time in our lives. And many of us, we miss those opportune times, those chaos moments in our lives. Many of us. God brings the season of intimate relationship. And we feel this urge to pray in the night. We feel urge to fast, but we do not do it. In those times, the pool is stirred. In those times, God wants you to jump in and soak yourself with His anointing and power and take you to higher levels because that divine visitations and those say God I'm so tired I'm so sleepy that program is on on the TV I can't miss it and if we have to get best out of those opportune times because it's only one opportunity for that whole season he will come back for another season hallelujah but for that season in your life that one moment that one day that one moment when he urged you to, to rise and pray and do something, you better do it. Because if you miss that moment in your life, you have to wait and wait again. Hallelujah. And many of us have been waiting very long. Many of us have missed so many seasons in our lives. Seasons of blessings of God in our lives. Season of healings. Season of, of prosperity and season, season of God's favor over our lives. Why? Because we were not so concerned about it. We felt the need. We felt the urge. But we did not do anything about it. Do not miss the opportunity. Hallelujah. Do not miss the opportunity. Do not miss the moment. And in that whole scenario now, he is waiting, he is waiting and waiting, and it is getting very tough for him. Many nights, he is there, everybody is sleeping, but his eyes are open, his eyes are on that water, because he's still waiting, God. It's been too long. Give me that moment, I cannot sleep anymore. awake, he's awake, his eyes are on that water. He's waiting for it to be stirred so he can have this miracle that he's been waiting for so long. Every time he fell asleep, he reminded himself, 
up and wake up. You cannot give up now. Look at the pool. It might happen now. I do not want you to miss his spirit keep igniting that fire within him. And every time he kept reminding himself, I have come a long way. I cannot close my eyes because in a moment I close my eyes. I might miss this moment, an opportunity in my life. Awake, awake, desperate for this breakthrough, desperate for his healing. He is sick and tired, 38 years of his life. The Bible says in Psalms 27 verse 14, Wait for the Lord, hallelujah, be strong, let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Psalms 27 verse 4. David says, wait. And you know what he says after he says, be strong. Why? Because sometimes he knows that the waiting can just drain every strength out of you. He knows that it will be difficult for waiting and waiting and waiting and seeing no results. He says, let your heart take courage, strengthen yourself every time you're waiting. An enemy comes and tells you, hey, it's not going to happen anymore. Give up, give up, you fool, give up. You keep reminding yourself, renew your strength within and says, I have come a long way and I'm not going to give up at this moment. Be strong, Bible says, take courage. Those who wait, take courage. Keep believing, keep believing, because that one moment is going to come. Amen. Hallelujah. All you need is that one moment of your breakthrough, and it's going to come in your life, and it will change everything about you. Amen. That one moment of opportunity you've been waiting for, that moment of healing that you've been waiting for, that moment of, of salvation for your children, and breakthrough for their lives you need with God, one encounter with this living God you need and it will change everything about you. Hallelujah. You know, amazing thing is Bible says Jesus saw him. Jesus came to the to Jerusalem but he didn't go to the celebration part. Hallelujah. Remember the two kinds? The celebrated ones and those who were hurting. He didn't go to the celebration part of the, of the city. He went to the pool. He went to that corner that was ignored. He went to that corner where these guys were sitting and they were lying and they were waiting and they were telling one another, I haven't seen my family for so many years. I don't know if they still remember me. I don't know if they still Love me. And the one telling to the other one, hey, they might be in the city today because there's a great celebration and there's so much desire in their heart even to look at their grandchildren or might be their children, but they're all lying there as rejected of the society. In their conversations, they're encouraging each other. It says, no man, our moment will come true. And he's all about thinking and all about his family and what he has left and there's so much disappointments, regrets, and despair in his heart. And that one moment, Jesus comes. Hallelujah. He didn't come to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast. The feasting was happening. Let you, they told him that they, let them carry on. He went to this one corner. There was total darkness. There was no lights. There was nothing happening, no music on, no, sh no singing or shouting. They were all in their misery. And he comes to them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I tell you up till now, Jesus, you will find him in the corners of the people where the people are hurting the most. He is not in the festivity. Why? Because he paid a price and he's concerned, he's worried for those who are hurting. So he was there 
Jesus saw him. You know, the amazing thing is, you are never forgotten by God. Hallelujah. No matter how long and tough a journey you have come across in your life, you are never forgotten. He made sure that even if he had to pick you up among the thousands, he will do that. Hallelujah. He comes there and he sees him and he spoke to him. The living water, the stared water that this man has been waiting for 38 years was standing in front of him. This living water, Christ himself, the river of life was right there. And the Bible says Jesus knew about him, that he's been waiting for long. You know, in the times of testing, a lot of us, we complain, God doesn't know what I'm going through. People even start hating God. But let me tell you, Christ knew this guy. The Bible says Jesus knew him. And he knows each one of you. He knows every pain that you go through. He knows the corners that you, when you cry in those corners, in the dark and no one knows your hurt, He knows your hurt. He knows the journey that you've been through. He knows the rejection that you endured. He knows the trials and troubles you've been through. He knows it all and He knew you. Christ knows Him. And then Jesus asks him, you know, he says, do you want to be healed? Very interesting question. Because the man is paralyzed. And he knows that he's waiting for the healing in that place. But Jesus asked him, do you want to be healed? You know, for one reason. He wanted to renew his strength. In that waiting time, many of us have given hope. Many of us, we have just, just shut our diaries and put it aside. All those dreams and visions we had, we just gave it up. Why? Because we've been waiting and waiting and nothing has happened. So Jesus had to renew his hope and asked him, do you still want to be healed? Are you still interested in the dream that you had 20 years ago? It is time for your visitations. Duck those diaries, open them, and renew your hope that God can do anything in your life. He says, son, you've been here for 38 years. Do you still want to be healed? Or you still, you're still used to this custom here? Church bringing the bread for you and church putting the shelter for you and everything you made friend for 38 years now. Those who got healed, they come in and visit you. Do you still want to be healed or do you like this place? A lot of us, we become familiar with our hurts. We become so familiar with them that we don't even feel them anymore. But they are stuck down in our hearts and they will keep coming back to hold us back. In progressing in presence and the glory of God. They are like these chains on our toes. And because we are so used to them, we will keep ignoring them. Everything is fine. Everything is right. Find those struggles, those challenges in your life. Find those hidden sins in your life. Deal with them. Repent before God. Trust in, trust in Him for a miracle. So Jesus asked him, he says, do you still want to be healed? He renewed his hope. But in, in his case, there are two problems I see. His response to Jesus now. Firstly, he said, I'm alone. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He said, I'm alone and there's no one to take me to the pool when he stood. I'm paralyzed. I cannot move myself. The first tragedy in his case is that he is all alone in this struggle. And there are many in the church. There are many in our families. They are all alone in their struggles. There is no one who will say, brother. 
you know, Jesus, uh, we find in Genesis, God said, it is not good for man to be alone. Loneliness can kill your dreams. It can hold you back. It can change your life. It's dangerous. It's very dangerous. <coughs> Those who struggle within them, I want you to find somebody and share your heart. Get some prayer partners to, to stand with you. Because if you're alone, you are going to die in that condition. You'll keep struggling for your miracles. Bible says in Galatians chapter 6 verse 2. Bear one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ. Hallelujah. God is telling us in the church. He says my children bear one another's burden. If somebody need a healing or miracle or financially they are struggling. Do something about that. Take their burdens on yourself. The brotherly love is lacking in the church. Brotherly love is lacking so much in the church. We do not feel each other's pains. We do not feel each other's hurts. We do not have compassion and mercy for one another. All we can say we are praying for you and that's it. Carry each other's burden and so fulfill the law, law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? It is... His law is to love one another. He says, love one another even as I have loved you. That's the law of Christ. And it's not a conditional love. That you will love your brother only when he loves you. You love him. Love him in spite of even if he does wrong to you. You keep praying. You keep believing. You keep standing. And even if you have to provide for him, you keep providing until God sees them through. Until that moment of miracle come in their lives, you carry their burdens. The tragedy in this man's life was he was all alone. For 38 years, for one reason, Bible says, he could not get into the water because there was no one to carry him. There was no one to carry him and even just dump him in the pool. Or even drag him. Or he cried, is there someone? Is there someone who can even just drag me? The water is dead. I need this. And every time he cried, he could not find anyone. His neighbors, his friends, they're all jumping in the pool. But he lied, they crying, Lord have mercy. Another season is gone by. The second tragedy in his life was he was focused on that physical now. Jesus is talking to him and his response to Jesus was still about the pool. Whereas Christ is the living water. He has come right across his path that day. But this man is so stuck in that situation that he did not even acknowledge the presence of God anymore. He was still focused on the physical of that water. Jesus is asking him, do you want to get healed? He's still saying about the water. And many of our prayers are like that. If we pray for promotion, we are so much focused on the promotion that we don't even acknowledge that if God is there. We so much focus on that boss that we have and he, oh, he can just promote me and bless me more that we do not even acknowledge that is God in that place. In that decision. And Christ standing in front of him. He is the living water. He is God. All the waters. He is all powerful. He is all great. He is the divine healer. But this man still looks at the water. He says. I want to get 
healed. But the water. No one. No one is taking me to the water. And there the Lord says. Standing there. Look at me. I am your promotion. I am your reward. I am your healer. Not that water anymore. I am the living water. Says the Lord. I am your boss, I'm your provider, I'm your sustainer, I'm your healer. Don't look at the doctor, don't look at the physicians or the boss or the company or whatever you have. He says, look at me because I am the one who's the sustainer of you. So he had to change his mindset, his focus totally. And then he commanded him. He says, Bible says in verse 8, John chapter 5 verse 8. Rise, take up your bed and walk. It was a Sabbath, Bible says. And in spite of his condition, it was forbidden. Hallelujah. Though he was waiting for this miracle to happen now, the Sabbath put a tag on it. There is no miracle on Sundays. But he obeyed. Hallelujah. He obeyed Christ. And all that God requires of us is to walk with him and obey his word. Hallelujah. If he tells you to do and even if, if it doesn't make sense to you and you have this presence. But this is Sabbath. Miracles cannot happen on Sabbath. And how can I even walk when I don't even have strength in my limbs? How can I even carry? Just nullify those thoughts. Believe in what God has spoken to you through His Word. If He says that you are healed, you are healed. If He says that you are blessed, you are blessed. If He says that I have called you, He has called you. Because He has paid the price. He has shed the blood for you. Believe and obey His Word. And can you imagine in this whole scenario now? Right next to him, another guy is paralyzed and he is lying down. He says, Are you mad? Do not listen to him. You're going to make fool of yourself. Do not listen to him. And you find those thoughts, those people will come to you and they will just try to hold you back. Are you mad? The water is not stirred. Let's keep looking at the water in case it happens. Don't listen to this man. Don't listen to Jesus. It's Sabbath. Miracle cannot happen today. It's Sabbath. You are all paralyzed. How are you going to take your bed? How are you going to walk? Do not listen to him. And they keep coming and they keep discouraging you. They keep bringing you down. He just shut his ears and says, okay, let me just try it. Hallelujah. Let me just obey. And sometimes that's what we need to do. Just close your ears from all the lies of the enemy. All the people who are telling you whatever. You close your ears and say, this is what God has asked me to do. And I will keep obeying faithfully his word. I am, I have waited so long for this one moment to happen in my life. And I cannot ignore it. I cannot let it go. And I'm not going to listen to you. I will keep serving. I've come a long way to give up now. I must believe. I must obey. The Bible says, as you obeyed, all of a sudden, there was strength coming into his legs. This all strong skin came back to life. The muscles, his bones were rattling and there was there's so much happening. All of a sudden he felt his skin is changing. All of a sudden he, he felt that his muscles are growing back. His bones are getting stronger and he felt a renewed man. And then he realized his legs can move. He realized his head can move and his, his arms and his whole body. And then he sees his skin and says, oh it's not withered anymore. It's new. 
And Bible says, he wakes up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One encounter with the master. He wakes up and then he takes his bed and carries on. Jesus healed him. Jesus healed him. You know about the tragedy I find in verse 13. He was healed and then he's gone. And in his way we find that he's met with the priests and all the leaders. And they have seen him for 38 years because the pool is right next to the temple. He might have waved at them or greeted them. And they asked him, wow, oh, you're walking and it's Sabbath. You're carrying your bed, who healed you? And you know what his response was? He says, I do not know the man. He says, I don't know his name. He heals me, but I do not know his name. They are asking, who was that? He says, I do not know him. The greatest tragedy. So much focus on the blessings and the healing and everything that we even don't even desire to even know the name of the man who's healing us. Because all we're interested in trusted in is the blessing. We don't want to know him and that's what he desires. He wants to know you personally. That's what he desired. That's what he wants to do. He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to heal you. Yes. He wants to bless you. Yes. He wants to prosper you. Yes. Because you're his children. But most of all he wants to have a relationship with you. And this man was healed. He got his breakthrough after 38 years. One tragedy. He did not know Christ. He did not know Christ. That pool of Bethesda. The outpouring of God. Was standing in front of him. The rivers of living water, the all-powerful, all-glorious, all-miraculous Christ was standing in front of him. Encounter that he's been waiting for years in that moment happened and he did not even ask his name. John 4.10 says, Jesus answered and said to her, this is at the well at Samaritan woman. You remember the story? In John chapter 4. And Jesus asked her for the water. And she told him, why are you asking me for the water? Because you are a Jew and I'm Samaritan. Verse 10. Jesus responds to her in John 4 verse 10. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who is it that says to you, Give me to drink, you would have asked of him. And he would have given you living waters. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Those who desire to know Christ. Those who want to have a relationship with him. God gives them the living water to drink. Hallelujah. And that living water... In, in, our, in our lives, within us, becomes the rivers of life. Because the Bible says in John chapter 7 verse 38, firstly Christ is the living water, and then we learn, those who accept Him, all He desires is a relationship. And those who accept Him and have a relationship, He gives them the living water. Amen? And once they have it, now we find in John chapter 7 verse 38, He who believes on me, as the scriptures have said, out of his valleys shall flow rivers of living water. Can you see the transformation? Him the living water, once we accepted him and have a relationship, we drink of the living water, and drinking of that living water, tasting his presence, worshipping him, reading his word, praying before him, you are drinking of that water and as you keep drinking of that water that communion that intimate relationship
relationship with him, that living water inside of you, Bible says, will become the rivers of life. Hallelujah. The rivers of life, the rivers of living water inside of you, according to the word of God, out of the, the valleys will flow the rivers of life. Isn't this powerful? That the waters are inside of us now. That pool of outpouring. The pool of God's blessing and His anointing and His presence is inside of us. But there is one problem. The waters are still. The waters are very still inside of us. And still waters, they can accumulate a lot of stench. And that's why we need to come into the presence of God and stir the waters inside of us all the time. That's why we need to come to church. That's why we need to find time to pray and read the Bible because the waters within us must be stirred all the time. The anointing and the presence of God, we need to grow in it. And the waters, this living water that God has given us, it has become a river. We started tasting it and it became a mighty river. We need to stir these waters in the presence of God. And that's what 2 Timothy 1 6 says For the which cause I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gifts of God. Hallelujah. Which is in thee through the laying of my hand. This is Paul talking to Timothy. He's saying, My son, stir up the gifts of God. Stir up the living waters that is inside of you. That is when I laid my hand on you, when you accepted the Lord. Stir up those living waters. Let it not stand still. Let it Through prayer and supplication, through on your knees, fasting, reading the word, believing and trusting in Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Put your hand on your belly, say, I got living waters inside. <laughs> Hallelujah. That pool of outpouring is now inside of us. We drank of it when we accepted the Lord. And that we keep drinking out of it. Every time we taste the presence, we taste the anointing of God. And it keeps filling us. And it keeps becoming a mighty river within us. My last scripture to you from Ezekiel 47 verse 9. And wherever the river goes, every living creature that swam will live. And there will be very many fish. For this water goes there. That the water of the sea may become fresh. So everything will live where the river goes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is Prophet Ezekiel having a divine encounter with the Spirit of God. And it talks about the presence of God, the rivers of God flowing from the temple, the presence from the presence of God. And then the Bible says that he swam in it. He tasted this river. Now he also had this river within him. And the scripture says, wherever this river goes that's inside of me, it will bring life. Hallelujah. The river inside of you will bring life to all those that are around you. The river inside of you will flow and will bring healing and restoration to people. The river inside of you will flow and it will bring provision because it talks about of many Plenty of provision. Healing. This river can cause healing. This river will bring supernatural. But this rivers need to be stayed. Amen. Hallelujah. That pool of our pouring inside of us need to be stirred. And once it's stirred properly, then it will flow as a river. And we need to keep drinking. Because he is the living water. Hallelujah. 
do you receive it today? And I've decided that every pool within you, the river of God inside of you, stirred today. I desire it must stir and it must flow out of you and people must be touched, their lives must be transformed, your families, your friends must be changed because of the rivers And those who have been waiting for so long for this moment, Christ has come. Hallelujah. Christ has come and all he desires for you to know him. All he desires for you to know him. Your waiting finished today. Your waiting finished today. He is there. And he is God of all miracles. He's God of heaven and earth. He is the living water who has paid a price for you to be partaker of his living water. So you can have this living water inside of you. I want you to rise on your feet and let's tear the waters inside of you this morning. Let's tear them in the presence of God. Let them flow as living waters, as mighty rivers within us. Hallelujah. Just a few moments. I know the time is all gone, but I want you to just raise your hand and just a few more moments. Very few moments. Those who've been trusting God for a breakthrough for many years, like this man was like. I want you to know that your moment of miracle has come. You might be rejected and despised by your family and friends. And you might be in this church or, or wherever you've been before. And you've been waiting and believing and trusting in God for this breakthrough. But nothing has happened. Thus says the Lord, the time has come for your visitation. He says, I am the living water.